Now, today we will deal with overall transformation kinetics, where the desire is to estimate the volume fraction of transformation as a function of all the parameters involved in generating the final microstructure. The usual way of representing overall transformation kinetics is by an isothermal transformation diagram, often known as the time temperature transformation diagram, where if we supercool the austenite into a particular re reg uh, temperature regime, then holding at that temperature will lead to the evolution of a particular microstructure consistent with that temperature. And although in this diagram we only have the curves representing the initiation of transformation, you normally have a family of curves here representing the progress of the transformation as a function of time. So this is our isothermal transformation diagram. And in order to calculate this, we need to have some knowledge of nucleation theory, of growth mechanism, and the growth kinetics, but there are additional factors. For example, these two particles, as they grow, will eventually collide, and therefore their original shape is actually lost. Uh, there will also be an effect known as soft impingement. So the collision of particles, physical collision, is known as hard impingement. Soft impingement refers to the case where the diffusion fields of particles growing from different locations eventually impinge so that there is a rise in the far field concentration, which then slows the transformation down until eventually this concentration is uniform everywhere uh, and you get the equilibrium fraction of the black phase and the reaction stops completely. So that is known as soft impingement. So here the particles haven't touched but they nevertheless have influenced each other by the interaction of their diffusion fields. Now, you've covered nucleation theory in the past, but I'm going to go through it briefly. Uh, and there are many nuances to nucleation theory and books written about it, but the essence of it is as follows. So imagine that we have two phases, uh, an allotropic tra transformation, and these are the free energies of alpha and gamma plotted as a function of temperature. And obviously where they cross, they have identical free energies, and therefore uh, that is the transition temperature, alpha having a lower free energy here and gamma having a lower free energy here. Now, when we supercool the austenite, the parent phase, gamma, to a temperature below the transition temperature, there will be a driving force which encourages the alpha to grow. And that driving force is the free energy of the alpha minus the free energy of the gamma. And therefore it is a negative quantity, a reduction in free energy. Uh, so this term delta G chem in this equation is actually negative. Now, We'll consider a spherical nucleus of radius r. In, in reality, it will not be spherical because we are dealing with crystallographic materials. Uh, so, but we'll consider it to be a sphere and its volume is four upon three pi cubed. So this is the net change in the chemical free energy due to the transformation of austenite to ferrite of this particle radius. There might be some strain energy because the ferrite has a different density to that of austenite, uh, and that will be a positive term. So its effect really is, and is to reduce the available free energy change. And the most important feature of nucleation is that we are creating a new surface between the austenite and ferrite. And if the energy of that interface is in joules per meter squared. Then if I multiply it by the surface area, which is four pi r squared, that that is the cost of creating interface, okay? So these two terms are positive and this is negative, and this is the net change in free energy 
when you form a particle of radius r, which at the nucleation stage is likely to be very small. Okay, so here we have that equation again, but this time I'm plotting it out. Delta G here is this bold curve, uh, the combination of chemical free energy and the strain energy is this curve here, and the cost of interfacial energy is given by this. Now this way is as R squared, and when R is very small, R cubed will actually be smaller than R squared, and that's why this term dominates initially, leading to a net rise in the free energy. Uh, eventually, uh, the, because the surface to volume ratio of our sphere decreases as it grows, uh, this term starts to kick in more. And therefore, we, what we see here for the net free energy change is a maximum. Uh, the maximum value here is G star. Uh, and to derive this G star, which is the activation energy, to get over this barrier. Uh, we differentiate this equation with respect to R and set this side to zero. And you get uh, both a critical radius here and an activation energy as a function of our parameters. Notice that the dependence of the activation energy on the interfacial energy is cubic. So, Nucleation is obviously extremely sensitive to the interfacial energy. You know, if the interfacial energy was zero, we would have no barrier to nucleation. So nucleation is only necessary because we have this interface created. And when the particle is very small and the surface to volume ratio is large, the interfacial energy term actually makes, uh, makes for an increase in the free energy even though the chemical free energy change is negative. Okay, so this is the activation barrier. And if you are watching a system uh, in which uh, uh, fluctuations are happening because of thermal vibrations, every so often there might be a cluster of atoms with the right structure and right composition to form an embryo of ferrite. And if that embryo is large enough to overcome this barrier uh, and go along this path of reduction in free energy, then we have successful nucleation. And that is expressed uh, in an equation uh, uh, like this, where this is the nucleation rate per unit volume. This is the number density of nuclei. Uh, this is an attempt frequency to get over the barrier, but not all of those attempts are going to be successful. Uh, so this effectively gives you a probability of successful jumps across that barrier. And this term I haven't introduced, but we also need to transfer atoms across the interface from the austenite to the ferrite uh, embryo or nucleus, uh, because they have different structures. So obviously there's going to be a barrier. Uh, that is a constant barrier Q, whereas G star here, is a variable because you know if we supercool more and we have a greater reduction in free energy then g star will be smaller so we will assume that this defines the nucleation rate and also that um, this is a constant nucleation rate all of these assumptions can be challenged and there is theory to deal with those but at the moment i just want to show you the essence of the problem Okay, so we have a nucleation rate now. So we need to deal with something called hard impingement, which is when two particles which have grown from different locations actually collide. So they're no longer than assume their initial shapes, but their shapes are modified by impingement with other particles. Soft impingement in contrast is when the diffusion fields of the particles overlap even though they may not have touched. So here, for example, these particles do not feel each other's presence because in the middle, we still have our far field concentration C bar. But as they grow bigger and bigger, these gradients become gentler and eventually the diffusion fields are overlapping even though the particles are not touching and the growth rate slows down 
until eventually this concentration profile becomes flat and you have the equilibrium amount of this black product forming and the reaction stops. Okay. So dealing first with hard impingement, how do we cope? Well, uh, Kolmogorov, Avrami, and Johnson and Mel introduced a concept known as extended volume. Okay. So what that means is that at first, let's ignore the fact that particles cannot grow through each other. We just simply let them carry on growing like this. And we even allow nucleation to happen in regions which have transformed. And that's obviously going to give us uh, an incorrect estimate of the increment of volume. Because when particles impinge, as in this devitrifying glass, you clearly cannot have these transformed regions growing into each other. And we also cannot have nucleation happening inside the transformed regions. But for the moment, let's assume that we are dealing in extended space particles can grow through each other and nucleation can happen everywhere, even in the transformed regions. So to illustrate this, uh, at a time t, we have these two particles of alpha. And a short time interval later, they will have grown and the increment of volume is given by these dark blue regions. And furthermore, we might even have a couple of more particles nucleated this one and this one. Uh, obviously, this one is incorrect because it's fallen into this transformed region, but never mind. Uh, so we count all the dark blue areas wherever they are, and we write an increment of transformation in the extended volume, extended volume. This is the true volume of the ferrite that has formed, not counting this one, okay? And we ob obtain the relationship between the true volume increment and the extended volume increment by saying that only those regions which fall in untransformed austenite are contributing to the true volume. And the probability of finding untransformed austenite is simply one minus V alpha, where V alpha is this volume in the previous uh, time period. Uh, so this is the volume fraction of untransformed austenite multiplied by the extended volume. This will be reduced to the true change in volume fraction, assuming that you know nucleation is happening at random. Now, if I take this bracket here onto this side, then we have dV alpha over one minus V alpha over the total volume. And that's like having a dx over x. And therefore, we obtain a relationship between the true volume fraction of ferrite and the extended volume of fraction of ferrite by taking this bracket underneath and then integrating. We get this simple relationship, which allows us to convert between extended space and real space uh, volume fractions. Now, this quantity is much easier to calculate because we, it ignores impingement processes. It allows particles to grow through each other and nucleation to happen uh, everywhere, even in transformed regions. So in any calculation, we begin by calculating the extended space. So imagine uh, that we are looking at a transforming system and different particles begin their growth process. That means break out of nucleation uh, at different locations on this time axis. And the volume of a particle that has formed at a particular value of time tau will, uh, and assuming that it's a spherical particle, will be four upon three pi. And this quantity here is the radius of the particle. Uh, this is the growth velocity. And this is the time that the particle has been in existence, okay? So it's the time t minus the point at which it started its life. So at a certain value of the time t, we will have, let's say, one particle. In the next time interval, this will have grown and a new one might have formed and, and so on. Okay. So we now take the volume of a particle that has formed at the time period tau, uh, 
and we multiply it by the number of particles that are nucleated in the time interval tau to tau plus d tau. And that is the nucleation rate per unit volume multiplied by the volume multiplied by the time increment. So this is the number of particles that have formed in d tau, and this is the volume per particle. So ignoring hard impingement, we get the change in the extended volume as, as this quantity here. Now we know how to change this into the increment of real volume, simply by multiplying it by the probability of finding uh, transformed regions, newly transformed regions in, in the untransformed matrix. So this is the factor that we multiply by. And I want to define the volume fraction as the total volume of alpha divided, uh, sorry, the volume of alpha divided by the total volume. And that gives us this parameter xi. Uh, and if I take this term here onto this side and also the volume here, then I get psi over one minus psi on this side and integrate for psi going from zero to one and for tau going from zero to the time t. Uh, when we carry out this integral, this is like dx over x, so we end up with a log, a log term here, and we still have to complete this integral. And when we do that, we find this as the equation uh, expressing the volume fraction of alpha as a function of the constant growth rate that we have assumed and the constant nucleation rate that we have assumed. assumed. And the exponent four here is basically a combination of the cube that comes from the growth part of the problem and then the nucleation rate per unit volume per unit time multiplied by a time. So when we have a constant nucleation rate and a constant growth rate in three dimensions, uh, the exponent that we end up with is uh, four. Now supposing uh, that the growth rate was parabolic, in other words, it varied with time to the power of a half, then a half cubed will be three upon two. And if we have a constant nucleation rate, then the Avrami exponent here will be five upon two, the three upon two coming from the growth part of the problem and one coming from the constant nucleation rate times time. So by fitting this equation to experimental data uh, and discovering the Avrami exponent can give you an idea of the mechanism involved but it is not unambiguous. So you need other supporting evidence, for example, direct observations uh, to verify that the mechanism that you have deduced is correct. Now the form of this equation is like so. Uh, it, it's a sigmoidal curve of some sort. So initially the reaction rate is, is uh, quite slow because the particles are small themselves and the number of particles is a number of particles per unit volume is also small. Then uh, they all start to grow and therefore you get an acceleration of uh, kinetics and more nuclei forming all the time. And finally you start to get uh, uh, the untransformed matrix starts to be exhausted and therefore this flattens out. So this is a classical sigmoidal curve showing the rate of reaction at a particular temperature. So this is very useful because uh, for any particular phase, if we know the nucleation function and the growth function, then we can work out the volume fractions involved. And then uh, each of those isothermal calculations can be plotted to give us the classical time temperature transformation diagram. So if I hold the supercooled arsenide at this temperature for a certain length of time, I will get 0%. 50% and then 100% of transformation and so on. So it's now possible to calculate time temperature transformation diagrams. And here, for example, is a series of, the, of such diagrams. The upper curve always represents the reconstructive transformations and the lower C curve, the Wiedmann-Stein-Ferrite and Bainite 
which are the displacive transformations. And here we have the Martin side start temperature. If you look at uh, the pure iron carbon alloy, you can see that there is just one alloy here which accelerates the transformation and that is the addition of silicon accelerates the transformation because it increases the free energy change in going from austenite to ferrite. All of these others actually retard the reactions and therefore we get increased hardenability. Cobalt is another element which can accelerate the transformation depending on the concentration. So, you know, the old discussion about austenite stabilizers and ferrite stabilizers is very crude. Uh, if we look, for example, at the effect of adding chromium here, you know, chromium has retarded these transformations and the Martin size start temperature has been depressed. Whereas if you look at the effect of chromium on the phase diagram, iron chromium phase diagram, beyond a certain concentration, austenite just disappears. You have ferrite all the way from the liquid. So we should no longer think about austenite stabilizers or ferrite stabilizers, except as a very qualitative rough statement, but think in terms of the free energy difference between the austenite and ferrite. Okay, uh, now, it's often the case that you get more than one reaction happening at the same time. For example, the growth of allotromorphic ferrite and that of Wiedmannstaden ferrite, or allotromorphic ferrite and perlite. So how do we handle simultaneous transformations in the Avrami uh, framework? Well, uh, here we have our two starting alpha particles at time t, and a small interval later, we have formed a new phase, beta, okay? So instead of having one equation with, uh, covering a single phase, in this probability of finding untransformed material, we have to include the volume of alpha and the volume of beta, and we should have two equations which we would need to solve simultaneously, okay? Now, in general, uh, the solution is not possible because the compositions of the phases are different and you may even have soft impingement processes going on, overlap of diffusion fields. But if you include this in a numerical scheme, then it's brilliant because at every stage you can change the boundary conditions. So if the composition of the matrix changes, then you can alter the boundary conditions and therefore, you've also taken account of soft impingement to the extent that we are using a mean field approximation. That means the solute partitioned or depleted from the parent phase is averaged out over the matrix. So you can have seven different reactions and then you would have seven such equations and seven terms uh, in the numerator of this fraction here. And here's an example where both alpha, oops, sorry. Uh, here's an example where both alpha and beta are forming together. Uh, and this is the net fraction of transformation. Okay? And these two will be interacting in both the hard impingement sense and in the soft impingement sense. Now, I'll show you later a way of converting isothermal transformation data into continuous cooling transformation data because the vast majority of uh, steels uh, would be treated anisothermally in an industrial process. But the same framework really applies. And just as we handle soft impingement by changing the boundary conditions at every step of our numerical calculation, we can alter the temperature at every step of the numerical calculation. And here, for example, is a, a calculation in iron, manganese, carbon steels, low alloy steels, where we are looking at the evolution of allotromorphic ferrite, Wiedmannstaden ferrite, and perlite as a, a continuous cooling at a constant rate of 11 Kelvin per minute and 101 Kelvin per minute. And there's a particular austenite grain size which controls, for example, the nucleation events. So when the cooling rate is slow, 
we obviously begin transformation at a higher temperature and we, we end up with uh, a smaller amount of Weidmann stand ferrite because the growth rate of a smaller amount compared with this because the growth rate of uh, uh, allotriomorphic ferrite is quite slow. So if you, if you cool slowly, you give it a greater opportunity to form and therefore you reduce the volume fraction of austenite that is available for forming Weidmann stand ferrite. And of course, you've also modified the chemical composition of that res residual austenite. Now, if you cool rapidly, then less allotromorphic ferrite forms and more of this uh, Wiedmann-Staden ferrite forms. And also, you spread the transformation over a larger temperature range. Now, supposing I alter the austenite grain size to a smaller value, then uh, the things change dramatically. The Wiedmann-Staden ferrite disappears completely at the slow cooling rate because the layers of ferrite that form at a smaller austenite grain boundaries, even if they're the same thickness as in the larger austenite grain size, will, um, uh, will have a greater volume fraction. The same thickness of layer with a smaller austenite grain size gives you a greater volume fraction and therefore you suppress the Weidmann staten ferrite transformation until the perlite eventually kicks in. So, you know, the power of this method is enormous. Uh, we routinely do calculations in which we have carbon, silicon, manganese, nickel, moly, chrome, vanadium, etc. in our steel. And uh, we can deal with all the phases at the same time. They will, of course, form at different rates. And for example, uh, if bainite is included in this, it will not form at all until the bainite start temperature is reached uh, for the composition of the residual austenite. The real point is that you don't need to think about the interactions between the transformations. You allow them all to happen at the same time and they will happen at different rates and in different temperature regimes automatically. So there's no fiddling about by saying that, look, I'll stop this transformation and allow this because that introduces more variables. Now I'm going to give you an example of a design that we did in a project uh, um, involving undersea infrastructure, okay? So, so very often when you're extracting things from deep, uh, deep ocean beds, um, you leave quite a lot of equipment on the floor of the ocean. And then uh, you simply pump up the uh, oil or whatever up to a surface vessel of some sort. Now, these are made of steel and they are pretty large objects. And of course they are in uh, seawater, so they can suffer from the influx of hydrogen over a long period of time. They are of course protected and uh, even cathodic protection, etc., etc. But nevertheless, uh, Eventually, uh, if you get some hydrogen going into it, it can embrittle the material and it's really important that you maintain structural integrity. So uh, we were asked to design an alloy for that application, but one which is much stronger than the currently used material. And remember, these components are really quite large. So this was a finite element calculation that was uh, done by a colleague of mine, Steve Oy, uh, just to see what sort of cooling rates uh, we are facing in different regions of the component, okay? Uh, so this information is vital because the structure needs to be uniform throughout. We actually want a martensitic structure throughout this large lump of material. And I explained to you that uh, there is a way of converting our calculated time temperature transformation diagrams into continuous cooling transformation diagrams. It's approximate, but it exists and sometimes it works. So if this is our continuous cooling curve, then we divide it into isothermal steps like this, okay? And let's say this is the time temperature transformation curve for 0 0.05 volume fraction, uh, then, for this step, 
this is the time at which you would reach 0 0.05, uh, but we've only got this interval at this temperature. So the fraction of the journey towards 0 0.05 is simply written as delta Ti divided by Ti, like so. So then you add up all the steps, uh, taking a different T1 value here and a different delta T1 value. When the sum of all those isothermal steps equals one, you have reached this fraction of transformation. And then you can do a similar calculation for another fraction of transformation and so on. Uh, and you know the approximation here is that uh, the reactions are isokinetic. Uh, that means that if I take a movie of the transformation happening at this temperature and I speed it up and it represents the uh, situation here, then I'm justified in using this approximation. Now, the point of making the material martensitic uh, is not simply to make it strong, but the idea is that we want to temper the martensite and induce very fine alloy carbides, which are mixtures of vanadium and molybdenum carbides, because then we can adjust the lattice parameter of that carbide. And if we can get the carbide to somewhat match with the matrix and cause coherency strains, then those coherency strains would trap any hydrogen that gets in. And you know, it was known back in 1875 in the very first paper on hydrogen embrittlement that it is diffusible hydrogen that does the damage. So if you can pin down the hydrogen atoms in the strain fields of very fine carbide particles, then you prevent the embrittlement because the concentration of hydrogen is so small uh, that when you have a crack initiated, the stress field of the crack has to attract the hydrogen uh, to it and concentrate, and then the hydrogen embrittles. Uh, so if it cannot diffuse, then you have prevented the em embrittlement of the steel. So we designed the steel, I'll explain how, and introduce these extremely fine carbides, and you can see that they have coherency strain fields around them. And our experiments uh, indicated that uh, they are trapping hydrogen because we have a method called uh, thermal desorption spectroscopy, where we can see at what temperature can we release the hydrogen that's trapped. And from that, we can work out the trapping efficiency and the quantity that can be trapped. To cut a long story short, uh, the design procedure is as follows. So we discuss a lot with engineers, okay, field engineers and experts uh, on the actual component to identify what is the basket of parameters that need to be satisfied. Okay, so this would include many parameters, you know, uh, stress corrosion resistant, hydrogen resistant, uh, the ability to make large components, the ability to manufacture in large quantities, the forgeability, and so and so, uh, so uh, and so on. So once uh, the engineers have put their impressive list of parameters, which must all be simultaneously satisfied in any alloy design, uh, you use all kinds of modeling tools to get somewhere towards the possible answer. Now, I say somewhere because none of these mod modeling tools are able to handle the complexity of the real problem, but they help to reduce the time and resources required to achieve the goal. So we then uh, proceed with uh, a composition and processing specification, and of course, nothing can be produced exactly. Therefore, we need to make the material tolerant to reasonable variations to be expected in uh, a, a production scenario. Now, in Cambridge University, we are a steel producer because we can actually make small samples of steel. So we begin with about 200 grams. These are actual samples, which we then uh, fabricate into these rods so that we can do lots and lots of experiments on our, on our assumed alloy. Uh, 
And those experiments will be quite basic, you know, for example, hardness, microscopy, miniature, miniature mechanical tests and the kinetics of transformation to see whether we can actually make the whole component martensitic. And then when we temper it, do we get the right sort of uh, carbides and carbide dispersions? Okay. And we can even measure the trapping capacity on these small samples of material. When things look promising, uh, we have uh, methods of getting people to make for us uh, 100 kilograms of steel because, you know, to do tests like toughness tests and so on, you need a significant amount of material. And also, you know, it is a test of how we can scale up an alloy. Of course, scaling up from, you know, 70 grams to 100 kilograms is not as impressive as scaling to many tons, but that can only come later. So once we have 100 kilograms of material and we do extended validation, uh, in this case, you know, embrittlement, susceptibility, electrochemical tests, etc. If everything is correct as expected or according to the design specifications of the component, then we would proceed to a very large amount of material produced industrially. And the final, final um, parameter that we need to satisfy is you cannot assume that you have achieved success until components have been made and components have been tested in the field. Okay, that's really important to understand because the scaling up to large quantities can itself introduce problems. But going through this process and, you know, you can have several iterations, hopefully not several, but one or two iterations, uh, minimizes the dangers of scaling up. Okay. This is an area of research which really isn't taken seriously. Uh, what happens when you start from a laboratory sample and then scale it up? It's not taken seriously by research councils, by universities, etc. But it is absolutely essential in successful alloy design. So you have to collaborate with industry to get to your goal. Now I'm going to show you a movie and the movie was commissioned by the sponsors of this project and it begins with uh, an engineer. ICAM encompasses everything from fundamental research that will not immediately go through the marketplace but it also has more applied projects. How do you develop materials that are useful? and how do you use materials that are useful. The university fundamental work is there to create, in a sense, new knowledge, new materials for a new need. Deepwater development is a very, very important part of BP upstream business. The reservoirs that have not been yet exploited tend to be high pressure, high temperature, and quite often they are also deeper um, water depth. So far, we were exploiting reservoir up to 15 KSI pressure. So within BP, we have project 20K, which is aiming at accessing reservoir with a 20 KSI pressure. This poses a challenge in terms of the mechanical properties of the equipment. We need to have material that can withstand this, uh, this, this environment. There's a limit to how strong material can be. We have reached this limit and now what we need is to go stronger. And there's just nothing that exists at the moment for this harsher condition. So if we want to be able to access new reservoirs, we will need new materials. One of the most exciting projects is the hydrogen embrittlement. We are after strong materials. Strong materials are particularly sensitive to hydrogen. Hydrogen will enter the steel by one way or another. Corrosion is an electrochemical process on components which are submerged. And if you put a current which reverses that process, then you stop corrosion. Then the hydrogen gets in. And even though the concentration of hydrogen might be one part per million, that has a dramatic effect on the mechanical properties of the steel. So the goal is to design a way of capturing any hydrogen that gets into the steel and stopping it from migrating to regions where it would do harm. We have quantitative mathematical models 
which allow us to address some of the variables. But these models are not sufficiently sophisticated. So what we do then is we make about 60 grams of material and we assess whether the models are in the right direction. After the computer modeling, we create our first melt composition. What I got here is a mixture of pure element. What Kelvin is doing now is to melt all these elements together and mix it all up. We're going to perform a heat treatment and then we cut it all up. One piece is to go for chemical composition measurement, the other to be measure the hardness. This equipment will separate out the hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen and then we can measure the amount of hydrogen inside the steel. When we first realized one of the alloy work to the specification, I'm very excited, but you know that more work has to be done. Things look good. We have demonstrated we can not only trap the hydrogen, but actually reduce the motion of hydrogen through the steel. It's great when there's a good result. It's terrific, but until we go to the nine ton component, we cannot actually risk saying that this is successful. But the point is, you know, the indicators are all in the right direction. All new ways of making materials have evolved. To really make innovative research advances, you need to bring something new, a new technique, a new approach. It's an enabler, so if we haven't got this alloy, we don't have the technology to exploit our share condition reservoir. The ICANN project is uh, focusing on the fundamental science and sometimes it's a bit difficult to, to see from an industrial perspective, the interest of doing fundamental science. All the academics I've worked with have shown really excellent expertise, very brilliant people focusing on developing engineering solutions. In 10 years' time, when this alloy will be available on the market and will enable access to new reservoirs, and we can look back at all the work done in ICAM and think that well, it was worthwhile.